What subversion is? Basically, it consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? The BBC is a woke institution. That means it's run by people who are quite far left leaning and this has been self-evident for quite some time but when George Floyd died they decided they would commit 100 million pounds of license payers money the mandatory license fee fee that we have to pay to spend on diverse productions and talent what this means is that they're going to be racially discriminating against white people and in favor of non-white people the BBC are very proud of their woke agenda and it seems that it seeps into every aspect of their programming they released this video from today Black people have been through a lot this year. Have we not all been through a lot this year? But what is this? What, is, what are they doing? Power structure slowly is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power. And yet they do have power. Listing the black people who were killed in other countries and suggesting that this is somehow affecting black people as a whole. And I just want to be clear, I don't think that any race as a whole is affected if someone in another country who shares their race is killed, justly or unjustly. I don't think it necessarily reflects on a different country, or even in the same country. I don't think it means it there. I think that we should be treating people as individuals and we should be looking at the individual cases. It may well be that there are unjust murders happening. I'm sure that there are, but that doesn't mean that every police in, in altercation with a black person is racism, even if it ends in someone dying. It doesn't even mean it's unjust. It could be that the person had pulled a gun and the police officer was defending themselves. But the BBC doesn't ever frame anything that way. Most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat an actor, an artist, a journalist like myself. And so imagine what the woke BBC is thinking when we come to dealing with a British cultural institution called The Proms. This is a huge, eight-week-long music, uh, classical music festival that happens at the Royal Albert Hall and has been going on since 1895. This is part of what it is to be British, and it's come out of our history, it's part of the tradition of the country. This is a prestigious event to attend, but no part of it is more prestigious than the last night of the proms, which is actually one that you have to earn the right to be able to go to. When you buy your ticket, you have to present five ticket stubs from other nights in the eight weeks that you have gone in order to be able to go to the last night. It actually requires commitment to the celebration of classical music, art, and culture that you get to see. And it des it's described on Wikipedia like this. The concert is traditionally in a lighter, winding-down vein with popular classics followed by a second half of British patriotic pieces. It's a celebration of the country, of what we've achieved, of the kind of people that we are, of what's good and decent about us. And I think that we're right to do so. I think it was really quite an excellent show of the British character. This is genuinely what 
we think of as the best in ourselves. We often have guest conductors conducting it, and much of it is made up of foreign people who have come over to spotlight their talent for us, which is great. We've always been an open, inquisitive country, getting engaged with the wider world, obviously. This started in the height of the British Empire, but it's a tradition worth carrying on because I think we do have that kind of outward-looking spirit. But this person, as you can see, is only 33. She's the first woman to be doing it, and the youngest person. She's only been professionally doing this for four years. It's weird, isn't it? It's very strange that the senior uh, symphony director, orchestra director, would be someone with so few credentials, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, you would think it would be the best and brightest from all over the world would be invited to come and do it. So we could literally attract the very best. But instead, we've got someone who's rather new, someone who's been doing that for less time than I've been doing my YouTube channel. Even going back as far as 2002, we can find examples of left-wing activism in the disguise of journalism that tries to make us feel embarrassed of our own culture, embarrassed of our own success, embarrassed because it is not sufficiently left-wing. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why, why 15 or 20 years? This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation. One lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No singing, rule Britannia, please, we're British. See how this is cloaked in the language of personal embarrassment and a kind of aboveness. I'm not prepared to indulge in what they describe as, quote, militaristic uh, singing. The previous year, in 2001, Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory were dropped because of what had happened on September the 11th, 2001, and they were deemed inappropriate to the prevailing mood of shock, which is a bizarre reaction to the West being attacked by Islamist jihadis. I don't really know why that would be the case, but the complaints were, well, I mean, it's militaristic, maybe we shouldn't have it back. That's a really weird complaint to have, isn't it? Because if there's any time that it's a good thing to be militaristic, it's probably when you're being attacked by radical jihadi terrorists, you know, with the aim of fighting them off. This happened in 2002, and we can fast forward 17 years to 2019, and we find precisely the same questions being asked. Should Rule Britannia be banned on Good Morning Britain, the most popular breakfast show in the country? And on one side, we have Toby Young, who's the founder of the Free Speech Society, saying, no, that seems kind of anti-British. And on the other side, we have someone I think we can accurately describe as a communist, who's saying, yes, this is racist and imperial and makes me feel upset. Try and explain to me why Rule Britannia is offensive. Well, I mean, the song was written in, um, you know, the middle of the 1700s, and that was when Britain was fully partaking in the slave trade. So to have lyrics like rule Britannia and saying Britons will never, never, never be slaves while then fully participating in slavery, mm. in 2019, I find that completely out of date. So you would, you would ban it too, would you? Yeah. Piers Morgan for all of his faults, and my God, does he have many, is at least a patriot. And I would put that down to how widely travelled he is. He's lived in other countries, he's worked in other countries, and as someone who has also lived in other countries, you do understand just how different we the Brits are to them the foreigners. Not in a bad way, not as a moral judgment, just as culturally different. We can distinguish ourselves from one another and... It's okay to like your own culture. It's okay to be patriotic. Slavery but it's was more ended. Than that. In you know, Atlantic. what we've been seeing we've... recently is we've been seeing, Joanna, a sort of creeping revisionist view of stuff that we have traditionally celebrated as a nation. Winston Churchill is now the devil 
to a lot of young people, mm -hmm. right? They're encouraged to believe he was a force for evil, the guy that basically single-handedly rallied this country to win a world war. Rule Britannia, which has been this anthem of celebration of all great things of this country, which we sing proudly as a nation. When we remember, actually, that those who gave the sacrifice, that now has to go too, because Lily Allen has decided. Just listen to the way that he says that. Why are we even discussing this? This isn't a question a normal country would ask itself. This is a bizarre question. Why are you, t why are you taking these ridiculous demands from fringe leftists on trumped-up charges of unique historical guilt that the British Empire should hold? Well, in fact, it's actually kind of the opposite narrative that's true. One of the reasons uh, we don't have uh, an Atlantic slave trade anymore is because the Royal Navy sacrificed blood and treasure to end it after the Abolition of Slavery Act was passed. Mm. Abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed in, what, 1807? But they were uh, The literally... West Africa Squadron was set up, and the West Africa Squadron patrolled the Atlantic to make sure slavery was ended. That, in you know... This year, it turns out that the BBC wished to drop Rule Britannia and Land of Hope and Glory from the last night of the, pro the proms in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement, as they say here, the BBC is agonising over decolonising last night's traditional bill. We are not colonised. We were the coloniser. We have not got anything to decolonise. You are talking about traditional British indigenous culture. You can't decolonise that which was never a colony, which is actually something that the song Rule Britannia reminds us of. Dalia Stasvenska, 35 from Finland, who is conducting the last night, is among those said to be keen to modernise the evening's repertoire and reduce the patriotic elements. Why is this foreigner, with hardly any experience, decolonising and reducing the patriotic elements of one of our traditional cultural icons. Why is she allowed to do this? Why would the BBC choose to put her in charge of it? Subversion can be only successful when the initiator, the actor, the, act, the agent of subversion has a responsive target. It's a two-way traffic. United States is a receptive target of subversion. A BBC source said, Dahlia is a big supporter of Black Lives Matter and thinks a ceremony without an audience is the perfect moment to bring change. We are of course treated to reasons why people don't like Land of Hope and Glory. Wasifi Kani, 64, chief executive of Grange or Park Opera in Surrey, whose parents sought refuge in the UK after the partition of India in 1947, is among those who would cheer the removal of the songs. I don't listen to Land of Hope and Glory and say, thank God I'm British. It actually makes me feel more alienated. Britain raped India, and that's what that song is celebrating. Proms presenter Josie Darby, who is black, which is important, I suppose, said, this year everyone is thinking about racial equality. The proms has always done that, but it is upping it out of respect for the current climate. She argued that the evening should be inclusive but retain tradition. Part of being inclusive involves including your traditional audience and diehard fans. But the traditional audience were not happy about this one bit. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President, and, and his administration? Who the hell are they? Spiro Agnew who was hated by the liberal left, called them a bunch of enfeebled snobs. And that's exactly what they are. They think they know. They don't. Of course, Kehinde Andrews was invited onto Good Morning Britain the next day to come and explain why exactly Britain was a racist country. Britain never, ever, ever shall be slaves. That's a racist propaganda at a time where Britain was the leading slave trading nation in, in the world. And I'm sorry, this is this, the idea that we're having this conversation now. That's a disgrace. No, ban is the wrong word. I mean, it's not censorship. It's just saying, look, some songs, particularly those two, which sell this art, oh, this is racist propaganda, which celebrates the British Empire, which killed tens of million people, many of which now, like myself and like yourself, actually, are descendants of those victims of colonialism. It's totally inappropriate to have these songs. It's not about banning and censorship. I am a victim of colonialism by that regard, because my grandfather came from the island of St. Helena, 
There are so many people in Britain now who are victims of the empire, living lives much better and more preferable to those in which in the countries that they would have come from. And the thing that really annoys me about this is that we all came here willingly. Like the descendants of slaves came to this country willingly because this country is the country that took the initiative around the world to end slavery. But here we have a professor of black studies at Birmingham University suggesting that somehow that makes the British Empire evil. Truly, Yuri Bezmenov was right. When you cannot tell your friends from your foes, when you are angry at the people who have helped you and your ancestors and provided you with this wonderful life and then give you a platform on public TV to speak to millions of people in order to what? Tell them that their country is bad. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative if not desirable, then at least feasible. Better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose. Piers Morgan had the fortitude to tell the BBC to grow a pair and call them pathetic over what they're doing, because it is pathetic. In fact, it's downright insulting and good for him and Lawrence Fox and everyone else who organised. But finally, after enough pressure was put on the BBC, they capitulated and said, yes, okay, you can have your songs, but without the lyrics. After Boris Johnson's spokesman intervened to say the songs should not be dropped from performance, they said, okay, fine, we will restore them, but only the instrumental versions. And even then, the Conservatives, who pull the purse strings on this, they would be able to actually change things at the BBC if they want, could only say, well, we really think you should have them there. Business Secretary Alok Sharma said, well, at least use subtitles during the instrumental pieces to allow viewers to sing along at home. No. What is this weakness? Use whatever institutional power that the government has, you know, the government of the country, to force them to do it. Threaten to remove the people who are in the positions of power who are making these decisions. Stop being so weak. And finally, finally, after they, this humiliation, this, well, we'll give you crumbs from the table, Boris finally weighed in. And don't get me wrong, I like what he had to say. Here you go. But I just want to say that, uh, and, and, and they're trying to restrain me from saying this, but I, 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 if it is correct, which I cannot believe that it really is, but if it is correct that the BBC is saying that they will not uh, sing the words of Land of Hope and Glory and Rule Britannia, as they, as, as they traditionally do at the end of, of last night of, of the prompts, I think it's time we stopped our cringing embarrassment about our history about our traditions and about our culture and we stop this general bout of self-recrimination and wetness. Perfectly good, perfectly charming, exactly on the right beat. But why did this come so late? Why did he say, they're trying to stop me from saying this? Who? Who is trying to stop you from saying this? Who are the advisors around Boris Johnson who are also wokists? Who are also people who are pandering to the woke brigade? Who are also people who are interested in demoralizing the country? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are, they have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for for the elected by you, President, and, and his administration. Why aren't they fired? Why have you hired these people? And if it's because you're afraid of the media, don't be. It's actually quite amazing after you take the smallest baby step to see what the media is forced to print in their coverage of the story. This is The Guardian, and they have no, no choice but to write headlines like this. Proms row. Johnson calls for an end to cringing embarrassment over UK history. How is that a loss? 
That's such a great win. The public is obviously going to be behind this. The patriotic Brexit voting British public and a good deal of the Remainers are doubtless going to say, well, of course, we can have a celebration of Britain at the last night of the proms, a historic place where we used to celebrate ourselves culturally. Why can't we do that? Any other country could do that in their country and we'd support that. Why can't we do it here? That's the question, though, isn't it? That's what it's all about. Now, subversion is a two-way traffic. You cannot subvert an enemy which doesn't want to be subverted. As George Orwell wrote in 1941, referring specifically to the communist intellectual class of Britain, what he described as the anglophobic intellectual class of Britain, who, in his words, loved to see Britain getting a kicking, it's a strange fact, but it is unquestionably true that almost any English intellectual would feel more ashamed of standing to attention during God Save the King than of stealing from a poor box. And by God, I truly believe it. I mean, this was Owen Jones's response. This, one of these communist left-wing intellectuals who dominate public life. This is what we should all be talking about. This is what should be a matter of national shame and moral disgrace, not a cynically invented row about the proms, land of hope and glory indeed. And it's about a, a refugee who died in Glasgow because she was in poverty and it's a tragic story, I've got no doubt. But this just is not the time. This is not what we're talking about. We have this piece of time parceled out for us to celebrate the good things about our country and the communist intellectuals, the anglophobic intellectuals, can't help but try and put the boot in. Take, for example, this Songs of Praise producer who today was reported to have compared Rule Britannia to Nazis singing about how they will never be forced into a gas chamber. How is that an appropriate comparison? Aside from the fact that we freed the slaves, us saying we'll never be slaves, well, we're also saying you'll never be slaves, but no, this is somehow the moral equivalent of the Nazis, literally turning us against our own history, even though we're the people who did the right thing, in opposition to those people who didn't. Even if before that everyone was doing bad things, surely the fact that we had chosen to do the right thing means we don't have to feel guilty at some point having done the wrong thing. The moment you, you bring a country to the point of almost total demoralization, when nothing works anymore, when you are not sure whether it is right or, or wrong, good and bad, but there's no division between evil and good, when even the leaders of church sometimes say, well, violence for the sake of justice, especially social justice, is justified. And we listen to them and say, yeah, probably it's true. Is it true? No, it is not true. Violence is not justified, especially for the sake of quote-unquote social justice introduced by Marxist-Leninism. Again, this is what demoralization looks like. This is an attempt, a direct attempt, to demoralize us about the country in which we live, something they have been doing since 2002, but of course long before as well. Just for the sake of this video, this is a good reference point. And this is disgusting. Why would you want to make people ashamed or disgraced when thinking about their own country? Even if this is exactly as Owen Jones says it is, this is not the country's fault. This is the fault of some small part of the country, a Glasgow local council. What does some, some Cornish local council have hold responsibility for that? I mean, we've got devolved powers. They raise their own local taxes. They make their own local decisions. It's not everyone's fault that this has happened, and no one ever, in any way, shape, or form, has suggested that Britain should be a country where nothing bad ever happens, because that's the sort of thing a lunatic would say. They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you are better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling, to the camera and do your job. The reason that I've done this video is because in the wake of Donald Trump releasing his campaign goals 
Uh, and they're all very, very good, I have to say. I mean, there's nothing, absolutely nothing in here to which I object. Every single thing, as, as an intent, not necessarily as a direct policy action, but and some of them are, but as an, in, as an intent and a direction in which to go in, in each area of life, these are really great. But the one you, you can see I've got highlighted here, and this is the really important one, teach American exceptionalism. And why would that be important? Well, of course, this is the active attempt at resisting demoralization that Donald Trump wants to put back into schools. There must be a very strong national effort to educate people in, in, in the spirit of real patriotism, number one. Number two, to, to explain them the real danger of socialist, communist, whatever, welfare state, big brother government. This is the best and probably only foot that can be put forward in order to combat demoralization, to teach a younger generation that no, actually we do have a positive narrative about the history of our Western English speaking nations. And we can be proud of those things because we actually have brought to the world innovations that have made the world a tangibly, measurably better place. And this is what Boris Johnson should be doing every day. He should have been out there leading the charge. He shouldn't have been the last person to speak on the issue when it was at its most dire point. He should have been the first, like Donald Trump is, saying, no, actually, this is the way things should be done. You can see why I'm such a fan of what Yuri Bezmenov was saying in his speeches and lectures in the 80s after defecting from the Soviet Union after being a, an agent of the KGB. These four stages that we you can see advertised on our merch store are completely true. Demoralization, destabilization, crisis. Well, we seem to be in the destabilization phase. We seem to be somewhere between destabilization and crisis at the moment. If the riots that are happening in America are anything to go by, the race riots and communist uprising that we're actually seeing, which is what Black Lives Matter and Antifa are, actual continuations of these movements, we have to resist it. This is why... I'm such a patriot about these things because fundamentally, if you're going to, you've got to choose a starting point and it's going to be pro-Britain or anti-Britain, pro-America or anti-America, I am on the pro-America side. I wouldn't normally be waving flags and cheering for nationalism and patriotism because normally I wouldn't find it necessary. I'd just go on about my life thinking, yeah, the country's pretty good. I'll go and make it a bit better by doing something decent. But when you can see a full-on attack on the very identity and essence of what it is to be American and British, well, really, folks, I think that we have got a duty to stand up and say, no, we are not going to let you take them away from us. We like our countries. We think they're good countries. We can see the evidence of our own eyes, the experience of our own lives. And this is reinforced by the fact that so many millions of migrants from around the world want to come here. We know that we have something good here and we're going to follow the traditions and principles that made the countries what they are. I'll see you in the next video, folks.